Welcome everybody to the MCE Board of Directors meeting. Um, I am Tom Butt, your chair, also representing the uh, city of Richmond. And uh, Darlene, would you uh, start off the roll call, please? Absolutely. Belvedere. Present. And Mill Valley, thank you. Venetia. Concord. Here. Contra Costa County. Corte Madeira. Here. Danville. Here. El Cerrito. Here. Fairfax. Here. Lafayette. Larkspur. Here. County of Marin. Here. Martinez. Here. Moraga. Here. County of Napa in all five Napa cities. Here. Thank you. Nevada. Here. Oakley. Here. Pinole. Pittsburgh. Here. Pleasant Hill. Here. Richmond. Here. Ross. San Anselmo, San Pablo, here. San Rafael, San Ramon, here. Sausalito, here. County of Solano, Tiburon, Vallejo, Walnut Creek, here. Roll call complete, quorum established. Okay, thank you. The next uh, item two is uh, board announcements. Do any board members have any announcements at this time? I don't see any. We'll move on to item three, public open time discussion. Are there any members of the public who wish to speak on any item that is not on the agenda tonight? If so, please raise your hand. Seen a raised hands. All right. Uh, item four is report from Chief Executive Officer Dawn. Great, thank you. I have a few items this evening. Um, first of all, I wanted to let folks know that um, we are continuing to work with the Community Choice Power JPA on a joint procurement effort for long duration storage. Um, and we're getting close to a short listing process, um, which will lead to negotiations with uh, several different counterparties on long duration storage. And um, we'll keep you posted as the, as the um, process unfolds. Um, I, next, I wanted to let folks know that the CPUC today voted out the PCIA proposed decision. Um, it did not result in a lot of the positive changes that we had requested. Um, we continue, continue to pursue the legislation on the PCIA, uh, the power charge and difference adjustment, which is also known as the exit fee that um, customers are paying, uh, our customers are paying to PG&E. Um, the legislation SB 612 would um, correct uh, some of the flaws that we've identified in this exit fee um, that are not being corrected at the CPUC level. Um, that uh, bill did make it out of uh, appropriations today and we'll be going to a floor vote at the end of the month. Um, we will keep you all posted um, when that happens um, as it may be helpful to reach out to um, a few elected officials um, at around that time. Um, and the floor vote will be in the Senate, I should clarify. Um, Are there any questions? I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I got a few other items. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to let folks know that after uh, your board approved the MCE um, cost relief program that we're calling MCE CARES, we have had a huge interest in the program, uh, bigger interest than we've had really in any program to date, um, really exciting. Um, on the first day that we opened applications, there were 800 folks um, that uh, chose to uh, enroll within the first five, um, I'm sorry, within the first day. That the first five days we had um, 1,000. So we're now up at about 2,000. Um, we did auto enroll 20,000. So we're at about uh, 22,000 total. So a lot of folks are participating in that cost relief program. So just, I wanted to share that great news. 
Um, and uh, also wanted to let folks know that our customer base is bigger now. Uh, before April, we were at 480,000 customer accounts. Um, but uh, now that Pleasant Hill and Vallejo are fully enrolled, um, we are serving 540,000 electricity accounts. So just wanted folks to know that. Um, and we've had a, a lot of outreach activities um, that you'll, you'll be hearing about via email. Um, just one I wanted to highlight is Power Hour, which was held on May 13th during the lunch hour um, with focus on innovation in agriculture. And that was recorded if anyone wants to take a look at that. Um, uh, last thing I want to report on is that uh, next month MCE will be um, presenting on a panel to the Power Association of Northern California, PANC, um, with a focus on reliability activities of CCA. So it's great that we got invited to be on a panel there. Um, and y'all will um, get uh, notices about that. If you'd like to participate, you're welcome to watch. Um, and the last item I have to end on a high note is that the governor's budget um, includes, his proposed budget includes funding for emerging technologies that provide long duration storage like green hydrogen, um, which as you know, is a technology we've been eager to um, get off the ground um, if we can find um, some additional funding to help support its launch. Um, there are also a couple of other emerging technologies that we're really interested in seeing get off the ground. So we're tracking that closely and I'm hoping we might be able to connect the dots and um, get some, some of our programs uh, moving with uh, some of that support. So we'll keep you posted uh, with that. I'm happy to take any questions. Um, any questions or comments for Dawn? Looks like you covered it. Uh, next item, item five is the consent calendar. Uh, there are only two items on it. Uh, does anybody want to take any, remove any from the consent calendar? I don't see any. So we have a motion to approve the consent calendar. Motion to approve. Okay. Second. Did you get that, Darlene? Um, I saw Director Wagon Connect raving his hands. Yes, okay. before anyone said anything. <laughs> so that's his, that's his motion. Uh, Director uh, Kohler, was that you that second? I did second. Okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Would you uh, do a roll call vote, please? Yes. Belvedere? Yes. Benicia? Concord? Yes. Contra Costa County, Quarta Madera. Yes. Danville. Yes. El Cerrito. Yes. Fairfax. Yes. Lafayette. Larkspur. Yes. County of Marin. Yes. Martinez. Yes. Moraga. Yes. County of Napa? Yes. Novato? Yes. Oakley? Yes. Pinole? Yes. Pittsburgh? Yes. Pleasant Hill? Yes. Richmond? Yes. Ross? Yes. San Anselmo? San Pablo? Yes. San Rafael? Yes. San Ramon? Yes. Sausalito? Yes. County of Solano? Tiburon? Vallejo? Yes. Walnut Creek? Yes. Motion carries. Uh, the next item is item six, addition of board members to committees. Yeah, I'll say a couple words about this item. Um, this is an opportunity for any board members to join a committee they're not currently on. Um, we have two uh, board members that have expressed interest in joining the ad hoc bonding committee, um, Director Perkins and Director Fear. And um, so uh, that those are the proposals, um, but we can also take uh, real time um, uh, nominations or volunteers. Um, if you're interested in being on a committee, um, you can say so at this time. Who's going to be first to volunteer? 
Uh, Director Wagon Connect. Yes, um, I was looking at the, the list today and I and it, it appears that Napa is missing on the, the um, executive committee. I would like to be on the executive committee if possible. Hey, wonderful. All right. Uh, anyone else? This is uh, Mark Armstrong from San Ramon. I'd, I noted also that uh, Director Perkins uh, had put his name in there with interest. He is not attending the meeting today, but uh, uh, so I uh, can only assume that he still desires uh, to be on that committee. He didn't indicate otherwise to me. That's what happens when you don't come to a meeting. You get put <laughs> on a committee. <laughs> Uh, okay, any, anyone else? Uh, I hear somebody, but is somebody speaking? Uh, okay, uh, are there any, uh, any comments or questions from anybody about, uh, about the committee structure from, from uh, board members? Uh, are there any members of the public who uh, want to speak on this item? Uh, Director Bunt, this is Vicky, and I just want to, if I may. Want to what? I just would like to say something about one of the... Uh, sure, yeah. committees. go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you. So uh, I just want to let the uh, members know that the uh, ad hoc bonding committee uh, where we will be sending a doodle poll probably for mid-June and uh, probably late June uh, to have uh, two, maybe hour and a half, two hour long meetings. So there's a lot of interesting stuff coming uh, that's next. Just want to mention that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Darlene, are there any members of the public who want to speak on this item? I see no raised hands. Okay, well, this is an action item, so I, uh, I, I, we, we need a motion and a, um, a, a second to approve these new committee members, well, to, com to approve the new committee members that are uh, listed in your packet, plus the two that were volunteered tonight. Um, this is Kevin Haroff in Larkspur. I'd be happy to uh, move the approval of this list with the addition of Scott and Holly on the ad hoc bonding committee. Okay, I'll second. Motion uh, by Haroff, a second by Quinto. Friendly amendment, Doc, uh, Director Wagner Connect added. Oh, yes, to the correct. Committee. Uh, with that amendment, I, I'll amend the motion as well. We'd be happy, okay. to, happy to have him. Who, who was the seconder? Quinto. I will as well, Quinto. Okay, Director Quinto. Okay, thank you. Uh, call, uh, call the roll call vote, please. Belvedere. Yes. Benicia. Concord. Yes. Contra Costa County. Quarter Madera. Yes. Danville. Yes. El Cerrito. Aye. Fairfax. Yes. Lafayette. Larkspur. Yes. County of Marin. Yes. Martinez. Yes. Moraga. Yes. Napa, County of Napa. Yes. Novato. Yes. Oakley. Yes. Pinal. Yes. Pittsburgh. Yes. Pleasant Hill. Yes. Richmond. Yes. Ross. Yes. San Anselmo. San Pablo. Yes. San Rafael. Yes. San Ramon. Yes. Sausalito. Yes. Solano County. Tiburon. Vallejo. Yes. Walnut Creek. Yes. Motion carries. The next item is item seven, resolution 2021-04, committing to advance racial equity. Great, and we're gonna hear from um, our own Alexandra McGee on this item. 
Um, I also wanted to thank Director Kohler for suggesting some changes um, to the attachment um, to the staff report on this item um, that, oh, actually they magically appeared on the screen here um, in red line. And um, uh, Director Kohler suggested some updates um, that capture some other activities of, of uh, cities and towns within our service area. Um, so thank you, Director Kohler. And um, with that, I'll turn it over to Alexandra to um, introduce this resolution and answer any questions. Excellent, thank you, Don. Um, and also my thanks to Director Kohler. This is, um, I'm not sure who's controlling the screen, but if you wouldn't mind scrolling past, there's a couple more pages here um, uh, for pointing out that there were a couple other additions. I thought, I already thought when I submitted the board report that this was a, a significant effort um, across the communities. And then turns out there was even more effort um, that has since happened since this original uh, research was made. So my thanks for your for the additions. Uh, you'll see um, up on the screen some, some additions to attachment B. Would it be all right to um, actually bring up attachment A to the screen? And, and, and while, while we're getting that going, uh, I wanted to introduce this item. Um, good evening, board. It's nice to be before you. Um, my name is Alexandra. I've been with MCE for about five years now. Um, and I wanted to bring before you not just um, a resolution, but one that's been crafted by a variety of staff and also a variety of trusted stakeholders within the community. And this has been a, a commitment to racial equity has long been a part of MCE's culture um, and our programming, even if it hasn't been formally institutionalized in a resolution like this in the past, um, we have consistently um, engaged on this issue through our pilots, our programs, and our policies. And this goes back to Dawn's days um, with Justice for Janitors back in LA as a community organizer, all the way up to, um, I think, Shalini and I published a, an article in the UC Berkeley um, law, ecology law quarterly about CCAs being aligned with environmental justice and being a, a natural ally to the movement. So this has long been um, a pillar of MCE's culture and it it's, pleases me today to bring it before you in a more formalized institutionalized way. Um, as, you, as you may know, I came on uh, about five years ago um, as a community power organizer. And that role was shaped by a grant that we received to center equity as part of CCA's uh, formation. And at the time there were only three of us, only three CCA's in the state. As you know, we've since blossomed into many, many more. And over that time have continued to demonstrate to our sister agencies how to prioritize and center equity as they develop their own programs, um, pilots and policies. So the document before you today was written by staff from all departments at MCE. We also received feedback from a number of trusted partners um, like the Asian Pacific Environmental Network, like Communities for a Better Environment, um, Puertas Abiertas up in Napa, the Canal Alliance here in, in Marin. And um, I think the resolution, like I said, further commits us to an existing value that we've, we've long held at MCE. Um, it enshrines those values, it formalizes those commitments and it furthers our deepen, it deepens our alignment to uh, address transition to a clean energy economy. So I'm happy to take any questions on the nature of the text, how it came together, the text itself or any of the attachments. Uh, are there any questions for Alessandra? Uh, Director Kohler. Yeah, um, just a quick one, and, and I think it's wonderful. It's a great uh, resolution. And I think, as far as I'm concerned, we're there the way it's written and all you're reaching out to so many folks. I'm just wondering in the future, do we wanna add something to it about LGBTQ plus? Um, so just thoughts for the future. And then just one quick comment. Uh, thanks for updating your attachment. The only thing I might suggest is it was the Tam Union High School District that changed the name of uh, the high school to Archie Williams. It wasn't the County Marin, so I don't know if it fits on the table, but uh, great work. And thank you so much for all your hard work for these five years. Thank you. Um, other, let's see a hand, uh, Director Kelman. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, well, Director Kohler uh, really synthesized my comment around diversity and racial equity, so thank you for that. So I'll just take the opportunity, Alexandra, to thank you and, and your colleagues for your hard work. This is really a, just an incredible effort. I'm so proud to be a part of an organization that prioritizes this. Uh, and I loved what you had to say in your articulation that CCAs are aligned with, with racial justice and really is consistent with our culture and mandate. So I just want to say great work and thank you. Um, other questions or comments from uh, board members? Um, Cindy Darling from Walnut Creek. And uh, you guys did a good job on this. Um, just for the footnotes on the table, Walnut Creek does have a diversity, equity, and inclusion task force that we're forming. We held our listening sessions at the request of the community before we formed it, but we're um, appointing members or reviewing applications now. So. Excellent. Other questions or comments? Uh, uh, Director Meisner. Thank you. Um, I also, really great work. I really appreciate it. Um, the city of Vallejo has actually just funded a diversity study as well. Uh, it's, it's in its infancy, so I can't really report out on it right now, but uh, we've already made that step. So thank you. I'll keep you posted. Please do. I think in researching um, how much work has already been done, I'm tantalized to reach out and learn what your cities and towns are already learning. Uh, Director Murphy. Sure, thank you, Chair. Um, just wanted to extend my uh, both thanks and gratitude to you, Alexandra, and also this team at MCE. Um, you know, this is such a beautiful resolution and it's so great to see all of the work you've done. It's not something that you just, uh, you know, put together. And it's really, it's an honor to be a part of, of hopefully passing this resolution tonight. Um, but thank you for your service to MCE. Thank you for continuing to think about these things. Um, these are important things to us. And also thank you for putting me to work. Um, I, I see here that Panol's not here. So thank you so much for putting me to work. Um, and I want you to know that your work is not only have you started and built a coalition of people, but you are building a coalition of people. So hopefully I can circle back to you or Don uh, <laughs> and let you all know that we passed something um, to this extent. So thank you so much. Uh, let's see here, uh, 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 Director Scales, Scales Preston. Yes, thank you, Alexander, um, for all your hard work. You did an awesome job on the resolution. And just appreciate you looking throughout the county and our other surrounding counties on what everyone is doing. It really just shows that we're trying to make it better, um, you know, just here on our board. So I just appreciate the board members um, hoping that this resolution passed tonight. And if there's no more comments, I would be happy to uh, make the motion. Well, go ahead. There is one more comment, but we'll take your motion. Thank you. Uh, uh, let's get, is there a second? Uh, Denise Athis, I'll second it. Okay, second by Athis. Uh, Director Her Harold. Uh, yeah, just a, a quick question. And again, join in the uh, congratulations on, on good work done. Um, in fact, very good work done. And uh, hopefully this is something we can share uh, with our community and other communities within our jurisdiction. And that, that actually leads me to ask, can we get a separate copy of this distributed other than just in, in the packet? Because I'd like to share this as a standalone item with our city council. Yeah, that, that would be great. I can clean up uh, the red lines and, and get a formalized a clean, finished copy. Clean up the red lines. I think it would be of interest not only to see the resolution, but the listing of all the work that is being done in the individual member jurisdictions. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, are there any public speakers on this item? Director Onoda? Yes, I've got a question. Okay. Um, thank you so much. Um, it, it appears to me that Dawn and Alexandra, you've been working on, in this direction for a long time. And with that, do you feel that this is maybe what you've done with this res resolution is somewhat of a gold standard? I mean, is this something that you can be sharing with other, um, other companies and you know, that this is how it's done? Do you have any thoughts about that? Um, I have a, first a comment and then Alexandra, I'm sure will add, add on to that. Um, I, first, I would say that this, this has certainly not been uh, an effort just by me and Alexandra. It has really been a, um, 
one of the core um, uh, vision and mission foundations of MCE um, from the beginning. And um, we are just two of many staff at MCE that are working on um, DEI every day. Um, in fact, we have a, a diversity, equity, and inclusion tiger team. Um, I'm, not, I'm not on that. Uh, committee. We have a lot of other very uh, capable, passionate staff um, helping to lead the efforts on that committee. Um, and it's um, so there are a lot of leaders um, within MCE uh, on this issue. And, and speaking to your second question, I, I would say um, that, you know, I, I, we do strive to be the gold standard, but we, you know, in this case, we actually learned a lot by looking at other uh, resolutions and activities throughout our service area. And we were really inspired by those efforts, you know, a lot of the language here was um, pulled from uh, other uh, other folks, and because Alexandra did a lot of that pulling, I'll let her say where it came from. Um, but the the last thing I'll say is just that um, we're very happy to share this with others uh, to the extent that it's useful. Um, but but we can't say it's just our idea; we just thought of it. Um, it's it's it reflects um, the ideas of many other folks um, that we've had the benefit of um, listening to and learning from. But do you want to add to that, Alexandra? Oh, yeah, just, just a little bit more, which is that um, exactly as you say, this was built on the structure, on the bones of the, the actually the Richmond resolution uh, back, passed back in 2018. And so we have a lot to learn from each other. We have a lot to learn from your cities. Yeah, thumbs up, Tom, but like we're learning from each other. You guys are you guys are in the community. You're the boots in the ground as much as we are. And I think it's really a, an honor to work for an organization led by community members, you led by the board, which is what makes CCA such a naturally aligned agent towards social justice and environmental justice. It's that uh, that the very, very top of the board of directors know their communities, know the pain points, know where the community could benefit the most. And you direct us in, in that direction. So I think um, we're very lucky to have a number of staff that are deeply committed personally and professionally towards the uh, progression of those of those goals. But also we're, we're learning a lot from your communities and your leadership as well. Well done. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from board members? I think we've got everybody and then uh, we're going to uh, public speakers. Are there any public speakers? I see no hands raised. Okay, we already have a motion and a second. So let's do a roll call vote, please. Belvedere. Yes. Benicia. Concord. Contra Costa County. Quota Madeira. Yes. Danville. Yes. El Cerrito. Yes. Fairfax. Yes. Lafayette. Larkspur. Yes. County of Marin. Yes. Martinez. Yes. Moraga. Yes. County of Napa. Yes. Novato. Yes. Oakley. Pinot. Yes. Pittsburgh? Yes. Concord Pleasant is also Hill. yes. I'm sorry. That was Concord. Oh, Concord. Yes. Okay. Yes. Got it. Thank you. Pleasant Hill? Yes. Richmond? Yes. Ross? Yes. San Anselmo? <clears throat> San Pablo? Yes. San Rafael? Yes. San Ramon? Yes. Sausalito? Yes. County of Solano? Tiburon? Vallejo? Yes. Walnut Creek? Yes. Motion carries. Uh, the next item is item eight. Proposed updates to MCE policy 015, energy risk management policy. Great, and uh, we're going to hear from Garth Salisbury on this item, our director of finance um, and our treasurer, um, and just wanted to um, make one comment that, that uh, this is making some adjustments to an existing policy to um, 
line the policy up with uh, some board action that was taken um, a couple of months ago. So um, I'll turn it over to Garth. Oh, thank you, Don. So uh, hello, everyone. I'm Garth Salisbury, MCE's Director of Finance and Treasure, as Don just said. And one of my jobs as Director of Finance is to sit on MCE's Risk Oversight Committee and actually to be the reporting member of that committee to the, to the technical committee and the board on matters related to that policy. So uh, the policy, the energy risk management policy. Um, and the energy, energy risk management policy describes MCE's risk management goals and principles that identifies the various energy market risks and so on. Um, and so the policy was originally approved by the board in 2018. It was amended once in 2019. And as Dawn said, tonight we're proposing an amendment to the energy risk management policy effectively to conform with resolution 2020-04 adopted by the board in November of 2020. So that resolution added to the authority of MCE CEO uh, to execute short-term um, up to 30 days, verbal contracts for energy procurement with our existing counterparty. So you know, as you know, all, all of our contracts are written contracts. They're for specific amounts of energy and so on. But um, in the event of sort of the, the, for like a heat event like we had last, uh, last August, um, it will allow um, M MCE to, through verbal contracts, procure for additional energy to address those, uh, those price spikes and consequent effects on, on energy demand. So um, again, you, you passed that ability through a resolution um, last fall. And so um, this is just to conform the policy with that resolution, which allows us to address that risk through short-term purchases. So the recommendation is to approve the proposed changes to the MCE policy um, 15, energy risk management policy, to confirm with the policy of resolution 2020-04, allowing short-term verbal, verbal contracts. Uh, thank you, Garth. Are there uh, questions from board members? Uh, Director Wilkinson. Garth, I... A technical question. Um, how long, I know these contracts can be up to 30 days in the, I'm curious to know whether these have been executed to date and how long they typically are for. Do they run typically for 30 days or they're much shorter than mm. that? Um, I will defer to others that might, uh, from staff that might be on the call as to whether we've actually utilized um, our ability to, uh, to do verbal contracts. Um, yeah, let me take a shot at yeah, that. Sure, absolutely. Thank you, Director Wilkinson. Um, uh, so far, since uh, the approval, we have executed uh, one verbal such contract for partial day last year. Okay, so they're typically very short term, but just give you a little protection in the day ahead market. Yes. Okay, All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, other questions from board members? Uh, Director Darling. I was just curious, um, I was looking at the policy and it says that sh this can be delegated to staff, including, and only lists, you know, two positions there. Is the intent just to limit this delegation or to the CEO or these two people, or is it is it broader? I'm not sure how things operate. That is I, well, the intent. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. No, no, ahead, no you go ahead, Don. Just, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say it is the intent to keep it uh, rather limited because uh, verbal transactions are um, uh, not something we would want to um, give the authority to a lot of folks. Um, other questions from board members? Uh, I don't see any. If I missed you, speak up. Otherwise, uh, are there any members of the public wish to speak on this, Darlene? I, I see no raised hands, Chair Butt. Okay, I would entertain a motion. Um, so does California have the infrastructure and qualified personnel to give the mental health community well, the response? I hear somebody. Uh, uh, motion from Director Wagon and Connect. Is that what this is? Okay, is there a second? I'll second. Okay, second from uh, Director Quinto. Uh, roll call vote, please. Bill Badir. Yes. Benicia. 
Concord? Yes. Contra Costa County? Quarter Madeira? Yes. Danville? Yes. El Cerrito? Yes. Fairfax? Yes. Lafayette? Larkspur? Yes. County of Marin? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Moraga? Yes. County of Napa? Yes. Novato? Yes. Oakley? Pinole? Yes. Pittsburgh? Yes. Pleasant Hill? Yes. Richmond? Yes. Ross? Yes. San Anselmo? San Pablo? <clears throat> yes. San Rafael? Yes. San Ramon? Yes. Sausalito? Yes. Solano County? <clears throat> Tiburon? Vallejo? Yes. Walnut Creek? Yes. Motion carries. Uh, the next item is item nine, uh, MC Youth Engagement and Workforce Development. And we are going to hear from our own Mariella Herrick on this item. So I'll turn it over to you, Mariella. Hey, thank you so much. I think we're just waiting for the slides to come up. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marielle Herrick and I'm a community development manager. Um, and as part of our work to deepen our understanding with customer segments, we wanna share some of um, the engagement we are doing with youth and young adult customers. And this evening, I and two of my colleagues will be sharing an update on our recent workforce development and social media engagement efforts. Um, these are the efforts that we'll be working on to build upon as we move forward. Next slide, please. So I wanna provide a, a brief demographic overview first. As you can see, the millennial and the Gen Z population is growing and have an important influencer role due to their digital fluency background, their diverse backgrounds and their shared mission of climate action and activism. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over, turn over the next few slides to Lindsay Mean to talk about our workforce development efforts. Perfect, thank you, Mariella. Um, next slide, please. Great. Well, as Mariela mentioned, um, my name is Lindsay Meehan. I'm the HR manager here at MCE, um, and I'm really excited to share some information about our internship program that was launched this year. Um, next slide, please. Historically, MCE has had um, internship and workforce development opportunities within the agency. That's actually how I started my career here at MCE. Um, I was an intern on the public affairs team and was able to apply to an open position on the human resources team um, and was able to launch my career from there. So we recognize the impact of internships and development opportunities um, and what they have on the individual's career paths. So we wanted to expand and deepen our efforts by having an ongoing program led by the HR team. The program has two main goals. Um, the first um, is that to create ongoing entry-level opportunities for members of our communities to work on meaningful projects. Um, that means that projects that will help them learn and that they'll get experience from, and also to learn about MC's mission and the renewable energy industry as a whole. The second um, goal of the program is also to provide professional development opportunities for our current staff. Um, by allowing them to supervise the interns and to provide them with all of the resources and trainings they need to be successful. Um, next slide, please. The way that the program works is that the HR team will work with departments and supervisors to create project plans and learning objectives for these different types of internship positions and workforce development positions. Um, from there, HR leads the recruitment process and we ensure that the job descriptions and job announcements don't have unnecessary minimum qualifications or kind of barriers to entry. And that it is clear in those that the positions are 
supposed to be learning opportunities and development opportunities and don't require um, previous experience because the goal is to expose um, these candidates to um, the renewable energy industry and MCE. So on this slide, you will see that um, these are some of the places that we have targeted our recruitment efforts. We work really closely with community-based organizations, local governments, community colleges, um, and then also organizations that target specific uh, development in their communities. Um, one example is 10,000 Degrees that is um, a program that helps support career opportunities for people who are the first in their family to go to college. So from these efforts, we are excited to announce since the program was launched earlier this year that we have brought on four new interns, one fellow and three temporary positions across three different departments. So we've um, been able to provide all of these opportunities to these uh, Next slide, please. The key component of the um, internship program and these workforce, internal workforce development really lies with the onboarding and training in order to ensure that we're providing them um, meaningful experiment, experience and these extra learning opportunities. So for the interns, um, the onboarding and training process um, really involve significant amounts of trainings with all of our departments. So this gives them exposure to what each department does as well as what each position in each department does. Um, this enables them to have exposure to all of the potential career paths within the agency um, and then also get exposure to all of the different positions um, that could be available within the renewable energy industry as a whole. Um, it also creates opportunities for them to network and have people that they can do informational interviews with to learn more about their roles. Um, in these departmental trainings, there is also a large uh, STEM component, which is um, science, technology, engineering, math. And with this, we really try to give people exposure to what the energy industry is, the energy economy, um, what the different grid, the grid um, and energy generation process looks like. Additionally, we provide them information about climate change and our um, different energy efficiency programs, the impacts that energy efficiency can have, as well as tools that they can do, um, take home to make their own places more energy efficient. Um, additionally, there's overviews of Cal CCA and the community choice movement as a whole. So we try to really broaden the scope of the education to expand beyond what just MCE is doing, but what um, all of the opportunities are across the state. Um, they also will have formal training in what MCE does, what our mission is, um, our values and our history, with also special emphasis on how the work we do impacts um, our communities, their communities. Um, we really target people that are in our service area. And so they can see um, all the work that's being done and how it impacts them. Additionally, a huge component of this is the ongoing um, training of professional development skills and new softwares and tools that they learn. For a lot of these people, it's their first time in a formal office setting or um, remote setting in this day and age but it allows people to get exposure of um, being in the professional world. So the second part of the program is for um, our supervisor training to help develop staff who may not have previously been supervisors um, internally in the agency. This is valuable development for them as well as it's also good um, experience and that growth opportunities for them. And some of these trainings include delegation, mm -hmm. um, feedback training, and then also how to create work plans and manage people in a remote environment. So next slide, please. So for our next steps for this internship and internal workforce development program, we're going to really be working to continue to build relationships mm -hmm. with local organizations that will help us um, reach into our communities and provide opportunities to those who may not have otherwise have them. Um, so we'll be 
continuously doing outreach and really working to target more candidates um, and provide opportunities um, on a larger scale. Additionally, um, we're going to continue to work with departments and develop more opportunities internally to have more interns and these internal work de workforce development opportunities be created for them. So thank you. From that, I'm gonna pass it over to Sarah to talk a little bit more um, about some of our other initiatives. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Sarah Dillamuth and I'm a marketing and communications coordinator with MCE. Um, and I'm excited to be here to share a little bit about MCE's Because of Youth campaign. The Because of Youth campaign ran this Earth Month um, this April and provided an opportunity for us to celebrate some of the incredible young people and environmental leaders in MCE's service area. Next slide, please. Um, I'll pass it on to Mariella to talk yeah, about thanks, this slide. Thanks, Sarah. So the Because of Youth campaign ran on Instagram and it had five goals. The first was to celebrate um, young environmental leaders, like Sarah said. The second was to approach Earth Day with a community focused lens, particularly because we are in a remote um, setting right now because of COVID. We also wanted to understand the youth priorities. Um, our fourth goal was to build brand awareness among our youth and young adult customer segments. And then finally, our last goal was to develop strategies to further partner um, with youth and uh, young adults. Um, the Because of Youth uh, campaign had two phases. Of we invited young people between the ages of 15 and 24 to submit their story to MCE's Instagram and encourage them to generate buzz. The second component, which is we're actively in right now, is that those young people who generated the most buzz were invited to be part of a Because of Youth blog series that's forthcoming. Next slide, please. So I'm excited to share a couple results of the campaign. Um, we were really proud to share the stories of nine local environmental activists over the course of the campaign. Um, these young people are really heavily involved in environmental organizations and local government. So for any interested parties, I encourage you to visit MCE's Instagram to learn more about their leadership and impact. Um, as a result of this campaign, we've deepened our engagement and opened up new avenues for collaboration with local youth serving organizations. Um, some of these organizations are California Climate Leaders, Climate Now, Sustainable Contra Costa, and APEN. Um, these youth stories received a lot of positive feedback um, and they make up MCE's top five most liked Instagram posts of all time. And we received a large jump in our Instagram engagement and followers due to the campaign. About half of the increase in followers was from youth and youth serving organizations. Next slide, please. Um, so on the left, you can see our Instagram engagement rate each month since January. Um, during the course of the campaign, our um, engagement rate jumped to 80%. And the chart on the right shows MC's new Instagram followers each month. Um, and in, in April, when the campaign was running, our follower account increased almost four times um, from the usual amount. So it's great to see that our audience is so excited about um, the youth leadership going on in our communities, um, as well as community focused content. Next slide, please. So let's talk about outreach a little bit. So we had a two pronged approach to this. Our first engagement strategy, which you see on the left hand side of your screen, was centered really around building awareness and mass outreach. Um, so we conducted outreach to over 32 community based organizations and partners who work with young people. And seven of these community partners reposted the information that we shared with them on their newsletters, social media accounts, and many of them have a large reach of um, a listserv of up to 1,000 or 2,000 folks. The second um, strategy that we embarked on was called deep, in, uh, deep engagement. And this is an opportunity for MC to do direct engagement um, with folks. And so we, we were able to do a total of 13 presentations and community meetings where we were able to reach directly 415 um, young folks through this strategy. And so from this process, we learned that young people to participate in this. Um, and so as a result, we had seven young people nominated. And of those seven, three of them were peer-to-peer -peer nominations. Next slide, please. 
And so we're thrilled to continue to work alongside our youth and young adults. So moving forward, you all can expect to see our MCE blogs uh, spotlight for the Because of Youth, where the most buzz. Um, we're also supporting additional MCE youth campaigns. And we will continue to develop educational materials and sponsor youth-oriented climate events and efforts. Next slide, please. And so this concludes our presentation and we would be happy to answer any other questions. Thank you. Um, are there any questions from board members? Uh, Director Rice. Thank you. Um, and thanks for the presentation um, and the brief sharing and the work. And regarding the internship and fellowship program, so um, and maybe I missed it, but um, what, what sort of compensation are we offering? And also just even a sense of the, the time periods. Is this during the school year, during the course of the year, summertime, um, just generally the sort of the scope of the opportunities? And then also maybe along with that, given that I'm assuming that MCE, like other organizations now, has had some experience doing internship work in a virtual setting versus only in a physical setting. I know we've learned in my office that, frankly, as limiting as having to be virtual is, it's also a great opportunity and created a lot of ease and accessibility um, uh, for our youth. Yeah, absolutely. Um, to answer the first question, we do compensate um, fairly and competitively. Um, and so we want to make sure that they are paid internships, that all of our interns are getting paid um, equally and that it's um, competitive for the market. And additionally, our internships are usually around three to six months. Um, so that way we can provide opportunities on an ongoing basis. So at the end of six months, we'll be the HR team will start the recruitment process again, providing more opportunities to more people to continue the role. So it's kind of like a revolving door of interns so we can train and expose as many people as possible. Um, as the program grows, we hope to be able to have interns on all of the different departments and have this be really substantial. The fellowships are generally a little bit longer. Um, they're usually anywhere between eight and 12 months. Um, they're usually a little bit more technical nature. And so they're, comp they're compensated slightly higher, maybe have a few more um, general requirements for it than the base internship that we try to keep extremely broad and open up to as many people as possible to really have the focus be on how they can be impacted from the internship program. Um, and then to kind of just acknowledge and support the second concept of the, we were so impressed with the amount of candidates that, um, and applications we received through the process from it being a remote internship program. I think that having the opportunity, um, and giving people this type of professional development and exposure to the renewable energy industry from their house is so unique and so cool. And so it's something that we're, um, really excited and from the talent that we have, we're really seeing the benefits of. That's great. And, and uh, one more follow-up question. So when you said that the internships are, the compensation is competitive, do you mean with peer agencies doing internships or competitive with, and, and, and if that's the case, is that competitive with what um, a youth might be earning just out in the job market? Because um, one of the things these internships have always been a barrier why they've been a barrier is because um, many of the folks were, who have not um, historically been able to access the internships can't because they're needing to work a, work a job um, beyond school. So when you say competitive, it's taking the place of what they might have been able to earn out in the, the regular work market, I assume? Exactly. Um, and then it is above minimum wage. So we look at um, kind of really what they would be doing in Alter, we want to make it worth their time. So we look at um, competitive on a large market scale, not just within other CCAs or local government agencies, but also private sector um, to really make sure that we're being true and actually providing those opportunities because yeah, a lot of people would have to pass up on internships because they have to make ends meet and we don't want people to have to make that decision. We would like it to be 
that this is an opportunity and can support them. That's excellent. And then just so two closing comments, Chair Butts, if you don't mind. Um, one, um, the training for the for your regular staff or who are supervising or working with this interns, I think that's just so important and and so great that we're doing that. And then secondly, um, if I would I would urge um, you and working with Dawn and whoever to consider potentially expanding the number of interns you, you can bring on. Be I think it's our experience in my office, we do a lot of interns. We were able to work with a lot more interns, but and we also found that because we had more interns who were interested in doing something during this COVID time, we actually, um, we actually found that it was really gratifying and they had found a lot of success and created a lot of great product working together with other interns. So just a thought. Excellent work, you guys. Uh, Director Gulati. Hi. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm not sure if my internet is a little bit bad, but um, thank you so much for the presentation. I'm really excited about this. Um, I think Supervisor Rice um, had very similar questions that I had as well. So I wanted to mention that in Marin County, we have the Marine Builders Association. They have a great internship program as well. They work with uh, seniors from, some, from different high schools in Marin County. And um, so I encourage you to connect with Marine Builders Association. I know that they also work in San Rafael with Cana Alliance. And uh, my questions were related again to Supervisor Rice around uh, people of color. Um, in San Rafael, we have newcomers that they are in high school and uh, they are looking for these new careers. So um, encouraging you to maybe have more interns and uh, thinking about, um, can you offer some of these internships like in San Rafael, for example, like in the canal? Because even if they are not um, high school students or like young adults, we still have like a, you know, work development that we would love to have a lot of our residents in San Rafael to have this opportunity. So I was wondering if you have any training around that as well. And again, thank you so much. This is great work. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, Part of it is that we did do recruitment efforts across um, all different kind of areas. We did work with um, YMCA, they have a 50 plus program to um, target some of them. And then they also have a program that targets women 60 plus and trying to provide just additional opportunities to um, as broad a range as possible. But we'll definitely be looking into the Marin Builders and continuing our work to bring on more interns. I think that we launched this program um, in March, so it is still new and it's definitely going to be something we're really excited to expand and be able to provide more of those opportunities to um, people in the canal, but then also all over um, our service areas because we are um, working in this remote environment. So location is flexible. Um, and so it's a really exciting opportunity to extend our reach of impact. Thank you so much, Lindsay. And just a quick follow up. I forgot to mention that um, if some of the training, the internships that Marine Builders Association were considering were actually in Spanish. Um, as people are learning English, it's always great to have the training. So something to keep in mind. As well. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Alessandra, I see your hand up. I don't see you, but I see your hand. <laughs> All right, here I am. Hi, I, I wanted to offer something complimentary from also from staff's perspective. So um, Lindsay and others have done a great job introducing this new internship program. And um, I wanted to just because you mentioned the Marin Builders Association, I thought it would be fair to um, say that this is a complimentary effort to some other workforce development uh, initiatives. So the Canal Alliance, for example, is helping us through their um, their college to career pipeline to identify students for some of the training that we're doing for PV installation, um, for photovoltaic solar installation. We also have a battery installation training program. Um, we also have an electrification training program for more of the hands-on work um, to complement some of the opportunities available, more of the in-office um, style skills that Lindsay and others are building. So just because you mentioned Marin Builders, I needed to jump in, but 
Um, these are all complementary and hopefully kind of create a more holistic ecology of opportunity. Uh, Director Kelman. Thank you, Director Butt. And Lindsay and, and team, thank you again. This feels like a meeting where everything's really exciting and positive and this really forward thinking. So I really appreciate that. Um, I have three comments. Um, the first is, can you elaborate on uh, the sponsoring of youth-oriented climate events? What kind of events are, are you looking at and how can uh, you know, this board of directors be helpful in our own communities and in helping with that? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think if um, Melissa and or Leanne are on, um, please feel free to jump on and take that question. Yeah, sure. Um, hi, I'm Melissa, the manager of strategic marketing communications within the PA team. We are currently contemplating at looking at doing, um, not necessarily for this year, but looking at how we can plan for next year about doing a youth climate action summit. We haven't exactly decided how that might look, but we're looking at organizations such as, um, it's uh, now this, that is uh, a news, it's a social media organization that's really has a high reach amongst the youth as well as multicultural youth. So we're right now in exploratory um, stages of looking at what that could potentially look like for next year. So more to come on that. Great, thank, thank you. Um, so then my second question is the other side of that. We're um, circling around the, the question of technical apprenticeships, but I'm not entirely clear how technical some of these are. Um, and I just wanna mention as others have, at least here in Sausalito, um, we have wooden boat building and working waterfront and maritime training programs that have California certification for apprenticeship that actually teach a lot of the same skill sets for you know, solar installation around welding and, and electrification. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the technical aspects or the technical apprenticeships that are being offered? Uh, this is Leanne uh, Hoadley with the uh, manager of the community and customer engagement team. And, and I'll jump in here and, and Lindsay may have more as well as, as the HR team has really been managing the internship program. Um, we are uh, just launching it as Lindsay mentioned in March. So Janelle, you've given us a lot of ideas actually of how to expand it and into other, uh, other departments within MCE. Um, my team has two interns and marketing has a couple of interns and they're getting involved in a lot of projects that I think are expanding probably the uh, working in social media, working in website uh, content development um, and interviewing some of these students are gonna be part of our, our, our blog series. And we're seeing that they're just thirsty for more and more. So we will learn along with them. And, and I'm hoping that soon we'll have another presentation here where we get to expand and, and talk about the, the next level of internships that we brought, bring on here. That's great. Well, and then I'll just make my last comment is, and this is really Director Rice brought this up about that synergy you get when you have an ecosystem of really excited young people wanting to do very cool things. Um, uh, if one of you could just contact me offline, I'd like to make an introduction to an organization back east called Dual School. It's dualschool.com. Um, and they create these cohorts around uh, internships and actually find funding for it. So I think there's a way, uh, synergy here for you guys. Thank you. That's great. I'll definitely be reaching out. Uh, Director Scales Preston. Yes, thank you. Um, job well done, ladies. Really love the presentation. And um, my only comment would be if it would be possible to lower the age. Um, for the internship, I know we're starting off at age 25 and if it would be possible to incorporate um, perhaps um, juniors or seniors that are in high school. Um, I myself participated in um, summer youth job employment programs here within the city of Pittsburgh. Um, and as a youth, it really helped me um, figure out what I wanted to do when I got to college. Um, and it provided me with job skills. Um, so when I got to college, I was able to work and had skills um, already. And um, I think that's really great for youth. You know, we have a lot of youth that switch their majors several times. And if this is something they're really interested in, it's a jump start for them. Um, I'm all about um, youth programs. Um, we just started our summer job youth program here in the city of Pittsburgh, where students will be working, you know, for some of the small businesses. Um, throughout Pittsburgh. And so um, we'd love for some of our youth in Pittsburgh to 
come over to MCE um, as well. So um, please keep our city in mind. Um, lastly, I would like to just mention the um, campaign that you all um, put on. I think that is just wonderful for youth, um, you know, to empower and to educate them. Um, and it just shows that um, with your hashtag because of youth and how your engagement level just went up uh, with, you know, adding more Instagram followers or, you know, just your social media followers, but also just they understand like influencers or young people influencers, influencers are the way to go. So um, thank you, MC, and for bringing our youth aboard. Absolutely. Uh, and I will note also that um, the internship program, we accept um, from high school through unlimited ages. So we really try to um, expand the amount of opportunities provided, but your program in Pittsburgh sounds amazing. That's really cool. Uh, Director Meisner. Thank you. I also want to thank uh, you guys for this great presentation and all the work that's behind it that you've done. Um, in such a short amount of time. Um, one of the things that, um, in, maybe I can talk to Alexander offline about this, but uh, you know, in Vallejo, we don't, there's not a lot of resources. We don't have organizations um, like Marin Build. You know, we're not a very, we're not a rich city by any means. Um, and our recently Alexander tried to coordinate with Solana Community College and they just don't even have the resources to bring on new programs. It's, so. So we don't really have the infrastructure, um, but it just occurred to me hearing um, uh, Commissioner Kalman that we actually have Cal Maritime here in Vallejo and they graduate, their graduates or the graduates um, make top top dollar in for, for all the California state universities. So, and they're really interested in, in combining with Vallejo and uh, possibly they might be a great resource. So I will reach out to Alexandra um, and if there's any way, if you if you guys have um, ideas about community um, organizations that might be able to partner, like we don't have a YMCA, we just don't have those kinds of organizations in our city, so it's a little frustrating um, that we don't have those connections. So, but Cal Maritime might be a great opportunity. So, thank you, uh, Director Quinto. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to mention again, uh, what a fantastic presentation and appreciate your uh, human resources department because uh, uh, you look at uh, our young people now and they have such a difficult time um, compared to how it was, um, at least for, for my generation. So uh, looking at the young people and uh, El Cerrito had a young man uh, who volunteered and was one of our summer interns who is now working for MCE now. And that is uh, community development manager, Justin Marquez. So know that uh, it works, I'm very proud of him. Uh, and uh, who interned for the city of El Cerrito. So uh, internship does work and you have some uh, great individuals working for MCE. Thank you. Okay, any other hands up? I don't, uh, if you don't have your virtual hand up, uh, wave, wave it. I don't see any. Uh, Okay, are there any members of the public want to speak on this? I see Nobody? no raised hands, Chair. Okay, well, again, that was a, that was a very interesting present presentation. Um, uh, in my mayor's office, we've always had two or three interns over the summer and they've turned out to be really hardworking people and have, uh, have, have gone on to great careers on their own. Uh, okay, that brings us to item 10, board matters and staff matters. Uh, one thing I'd like to just question I'd like to bring up is, uh, uh, Dawn, what, uh, what are the plans for uh, reopening or the end of COVID or whatever you want to call it? You, you know, if you want to speak about it briefly now, or maybe we could do it at a future meeting, but it's uh, that time is kind of up on us. Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to speak to that briefly now and also happy to spend more time on it in the future. Um, we have uh, looked at what the current restrictions are and given that there are still 
um, some uh, some um, additional uh, things we would need to add to our in-person offices, um, like uh, plastic screens um, and other many other items and protocols. Um, we've made the decision to um, keep our offices closed for day-to-day uh, -to -day work until the end of September. Um, so that at that time, um, we expect that we would be able to open up um, with uh, things being back to normal, not having to invest in plastic screens and thermometers or other protocols. Um, our staff has done a good job of staying very productive um, working remotely. So um, we thought it might make sense to um, allow that to continue just a few more months while things um, uh, do go back to normal 100% in, ho in hopes that that's what will happen. Um, I think the bigger question is um, what will happen after that time? And uh, as we want to attract and retain the best and the brightest, as always, um, we're looking at what other folks in the industry are going to be offering to staff as far as, far as flexibility, um, allowing for more remote work than maybe was um, common before um, COVID. Um, so I think, you know, we're, we're assessing um, those opportunities while also looking at our um, our interest in you know, being in person and you know, as a public agency, we obviously will have doors open to the public. Um, we really look forward to that. We look forward to having in-person meetings again um, and having more uh, in-person staff activity. Um, but I, we do expect that the new normal is going to be a little bit different than the old normal and there's probably going to be more um, remote participation um, in meetings going forward. Um, one of the uh, silver linings has been the reduction in uh, fossil fuel emissions as folks have been able to participate without getting in their cars and, and traveling. Um, in some cases, it's allowed for more accessibility. We've, we've had some members of the public able to join us um, that couldn't physically get to our meetings in the past. Um, so there, there have been some silver linings and we've learned um, a bit how to um, build on those. So um, going forward, uh, you know, we may want to have, um, have it be more common for uh, board members to participate from a location different from our board, our two board rooms where we used to um, uh, have everyone participating. Um, at this time, we, we uh, do plan to keep both of our offices, uh, Sandra Fallon Concord, um, and uh, once we're back open, which I expect will be um, as of October 1st, we would uh, be holding our uh, meetings, our public meetings, um, with uh, in-person um, options. And uh, you know, I think we'll take some time to see um, how interested folks are in being in person versus being remote. Um, and we're very open to input at this stage as we sort of assess the um, the um, what's happening in the industry and. Um, what happens with CDC requirements um, and business as usual. So. Uh, uh, Director Murphy. Thank you. Um, first and foremost, I wanted to thank Don and the MCE team for the Because of Youth campaign. It was absolutely amazing. And it was truly um, even such a blessing to see um, one of our young people from Panol, um, Kevin, featured when he circled back with me after being featured it was truly I mean it was almost like moving to me how moved he was by that opportunity um, and I just want to say like when we you know water seeds like Kevin we get hundreds hundreds of blooms and so I just want to just say thank you so much for that that was so beautiful to see all of my blown. Um, secondly I just wanted to report to everyone that the city of Panol our city council this past week have uh, have passed a letter of support um, of Senate Bill 612. Um, and so we are joining MC and this team uh, and pushing to make sure we protect rate payers and, and hopefully, uh, uh, hopefully that will move um, very quickly in the state legislature. So please keep us updated. Uh, we are happy to be part of the team and thanks for uh, keeping us informed with that. Uh, Director Zorn. Thank you. I, I'm glad that uh, Director Murphy brought that up in his comments. That was actually my question. Don, you had mentioned earlier when you were giving your updates about SB 612, you kind of voiced a little bit of concern about its lack of progress. And I didn't get a chance to ask earlier. I was wondering if you could elaborate on your thoughts there and kind of what the status of it, of it is and um, if more cities can be 
uh, using that letter template that you sent in an email uh, a board meeting or two ago. Um, and if you do need that, uh, please let us know and, and we can activate our groups. Yeah, thank you so much um, for the question. And I'm, I'm happy to um, elaborate. I, I think that the, um, the, there has been a process underway at the Public Utilities Commission to address these exit fees. And, and the, the main issue with the exit fees is that um, all customers, uh, our cus MCE's customers and bundled customers that are still getting their generation from PG&E, that we all have to pay the above market cost of PG&E's um, energy purchases from contracts that have been executed in the past. So if they um, entered into a contract, say in 2010, for uh, uh, energy that costs more than it's worth today, um, all customers have to share in the, the burden of you know, paying, that, paying for that commitment um, up until the time when, when you depart as a customer. So, um, so uh, once you depart uh, as a PG&E customer for generation, if they enter into new contracts after that, you don't have to pay um, for those. But any, any contracts they entered into before you depart, you have to um, carry your fair share. Now, the, the problem with the, uh, with the way the exit fee is structured is that there are not built-in incentives for um, PG&E and the other uh, investor-owned utilities to sell off the extra power they don't need. There's been so much um, CCA growth, so many community choice programs uh, launching across the state that the um, uh, investor and utilities like PG&E have many more resources than they need. And um, many of these resources are long-term contracts, 10-year contracts, sometimes even 20-year contracts, which we will continue to be paying for for a long time until they, they drop off. Instead of selling off the, those long-term contracts with the high value that a long-term contract has, um, they are often just uh, dumping this power in the spot market or in the day-ahead market at a very low price. And um, that's not good for the customers because um, that means that we're having to pay the difference between what they bought the energy for and what they sold the energy for. And there's a big delta there. What we are advocating for at the CPUC is that the, that PG&E and the other investor-owned utilities be uh, required to sell off the power that they don't need at, a, at the highest value they can get for it to, to make us, the customers, as full as possible um, for, for that power. Um, they don't have any incentives to do that right now. And, and some might argue they even have a disincentive to keep that exit fee high uh, for customers. Um, because that makes it more difficult for CCA, CCAs to be competitive um, with, with the PG&E's rates. So um, that is a, a, a kind of a, an overview of what, what is the issue with the PCIA, what we've been pushing for at the CPC. And unfortunately, our requests at the CPC have not um, been uh, accepted or approved. Um, and after um, the PCI proceeding that was just decided upon today, is the culmination of over 450 days, I think, of a proceeding. So it's been over a year that we've been working on this at the CPUC. It was just voted out today um, uh, and the commissioners did not accept most of our recommendations. Um, I gave you one example of the above market cost issue. There are many other flaws with the, the PCIA um, that I, I don't wanna take up too much time here tonight, but I will give just one other example. And that is that Although all of our customers are paying the PCIA for resources that are in PG&E's portfolio, in many cases, we don't get any value from those resources. So um, the uh, resource adequacy value, for example, that all of our customers are paying for, they don't receive any benefit from that. And we're having to buy resource adequacy as if they uh, didn't, aren't pay weren't paying for any. So we're double, double buying for something and customers are double paying for something. Uh, so one of the things we had requested was that the value of that RA get transferred back um, to the customer or to the CCA so that um, that value would stay with the entity that's paying. Um, that was another recommendation that was not accepted by the CPUC. And because the, um, you know, in some cases it does appear that the CPUC makes decisions that are um, in line with, with what the utilities are pushing for, the investor and utilities are pushing for, 
we have found that in this case, it may be necessary to go to the legislature to look for a different, a, a different route, a different um, leadership body to, um, to address these issues outside of that close-knit relationship that the CPUC has with the investor-owned utilities. Um, we have found uh, a lot of interest among many legislators in addressing this issue through SB 612, this bill. Um, in fact, there are more than 20 authors that have co-authors co that have signed on to this bill because there's so many CCA communities around the state that want to fix this problem. Um, but there is um, staunch opposition uh, from uh, the utilities and some of the utilities unions um, trying to um, get this bill, make sure this bill does not pass. Um, and their t the tactics, as we've seen in the past, include a lot of misinformation. Um, they, I listened to the hearings um, where arguments were being made by the opponents, and they were making claims that this bill would would shift costs from CCA customers back to bundled customers, customers that are not with the CCA, but with the uh, investor and utility. That's simply not true. This, the changes we're requesting would reduce costs for all customers, um, uh, but the misinformation is circulating. So we're doing our best to get the accurate information out there to, um, the, uh, to our delegation. Um, and encouraging our delegation to support the bill. Many of our uh, uh, delegation is, will be supporting the bill, um, but there are uh, a few that um, are, are still on the fence and, and we don't know that they will be supporting the bill. Um, it may be because they're getting this information and thinking that it's accurate. So um, outreach to um, our legislators um, uh, could be very helpful, uh, particularly in the Senate at the end of the month. Um, and, and uh, then as we move over to the uh, assembly side uh, next, uh, next month, we will be needing, um, we'll be needing some support on that side. So uh, I know that was a long-winded answer. I, apologies for that. Uh, Director Onoda, unmute yourself, please. Sorry, thank you. Thank you so much, Don, for that explanation. Um, Moraga Town Council supported um, 612, but I had a hard time trying to explain it. So I think I'm going to email um, one of the council members and, you know, I took notes of what you said. So thank you very much, because this is, this is hard to explain and it's, it's something that we don't normally deal with. So I appreciate it. And I hope all of the other cities and towns support this as well. It needs to change. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Uh, any comments from staff? I don't see any. Um, I believe it's time to adjourn. Uh, anybody wanna bring anything else up before we declare adjournment? Going once, going twice. Okay, everybody have a good evening. Uh, we are adjourned. Thank you all. Good night. Good, good evening. Good evening. Good evening.